Welcome to this seminar in which we are dealing with the religion of Islam. In seminar number six, we began a comparison of the life, words, and works of Jesus Christ to those of Muhammad. And we restricted our comparison to what the New Testament and the Old Testament, that is the Holy Bible, tells us about Jesus Christ. We learned, for example, that his coming, his works, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and his coming then to judge the living and the dead, all of these things had been prophesied in the Old Testament. And thus we restricted ourselves to the teachings in the New Testament concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ. In the same way, we are restricting ourselves to the founding articles or documents of Islam concerning the person and work of Muhammad. Thus, we are relying particularly upon the teaching that is given in the Quran concerning the life and purpose and ministry of Muhammad. And we are also depending upon the Hadith, which is the collection of the earliest Muslim writings concerning Muhammad that was made by his relatives, by his family members, and by his closest friends and disciples. The Hadith is revered and reviewed and received as being equally inspired to the Quran by our Muslim friends. We are thus not relying upon later Muslim legends and myths in which after they came to confrontation with Christian theologians, some Muslims sought to renovate and to restructure and to rewrite the history of Muhammad so that it would more closely parallel the miraculous life of Jesus Christ. Ali Dashti, who was the foreign minister of Iran and one of the most respected modern Muslim scholars, and he was a Muslim and not a Christian, had this to say in his exciting book, 23 Years, A Study of the Prophetic Career of Muhammad, page one, dealing with the chapter on Muhammad. Muslims as well as others, have disregarded the historical facts. They have continually striven to turn this man, Muhammad, into an imaginary superhuman being, a sort of God in human clothes, and have generally ignored the ample evidence of his humanity. They have been ready to set aside the law of cause and effect which governs real life and to present their fantasies as miracles. He documents this charge in terms of the later, later uh, legends and fables and myths that were created around Muhammad. For example, uh, according to one uh, Muslim writer, quote, as soon as Muhammad came out of his mother's room, he said, God is great. So we have the infant right out of the room speaking. At one month, Muhammad crawled. At two months, he stood. At three months, he walked. At four months he ran, and at nine months he shot arrows. So here we have a Muslim legend concerning Muhammad, in which starting right from being an infant, he could talk about al Akbar in terms of God being great. And then at four months, he was not only running, walking, and talking, but he was, he was shooting the bow and the arrow. Dashti comments, quote, This story is an example of myth-making, and history fabrication by Muslims. This is why Muslim scholars as well as Western scholars have dismissed these crazy legends and fables concerning Muhammad. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, in a dozen places, Allah reminds Muhammad, you are only a man, and tell everyone you are only a man just like them. Matter of fact, as we saw Last In our last seminar, as we began our discussion of a comparison between Jesus and Muhammad, that Muhammad's coming was not prophesied in the Bible. He had a natural birth, the product of his parents. He was not perfect or sinless. According to the Quran, he did no miracles. The only sign or miracle that Muhammad could ever give was the Quran itself. And thus, the Quran or the Hadith Never record where Muhammad healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, or could rule the wind and the waves, or to feed the multitudes, or walk on the water, or whatever it is. Muhammad did not preach the love of God. 
Muhammad was only a man and not a supernatural being. He was not God as well as man. There was nothing outstanding in his speeches. And he was not a high moral example, but an immoral example. And when we contrast this with the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, in his person and work, had been prophesied and predicted in the Bible. Indeed, the day that Christ died, 33 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in one day. Jesus was not given a natural birth. His birth was a miracle. It was a virgin birth. The Holy Spirit conceived the Lord Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. He did mighty miracles such as healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, ruling the wind and the waves. He preached the love of God. He was God as well as man. He was the greatest speech maker and sermon giver that ever lived. And he gave us the highest possible moral example. We also saw in our discussion last time that Jesus never killed anyone, neither did he rob anyone, but Muhammad killed and robbed people all by the authority and in the name of Allah. Jesus never forced anyone to believe his message, but Muhammad did. As is recorded in the Quran and the Hadith, he forced people to give up their worship of idols. When he conquered Mecca, he used the power of the sword to destroy the idols which belonged to other people and to force them to embrace Islam or die. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, it says that if people will not accept Islam, uh, Islam they can be executed, they can be crucified, uh, they can cut off a leg, a foot, a hand, or they can be taxed or even exiled, all as a form of coercion to force people to accept his religion. And lastly, we saw uh, in the last se uh, session that Jesus never told his followers to kill or to rob anyone. You will search the New Testament in vain to find Jesus sending out his uh, apostles as a band of bandits to wait along the roadside to rob caravans. Uh, Jesus never sent his followers out to attack settlements and to murder every man in there and then to take the women and to rape them and to sell the children to slavery. Yet these are the kinds of things that Muhammad commanded his followers to do all in the name of Allah. Thus his raiding of the caravans, going forth to attack and to loot Jewish settlements, all of these things are so well documented by Muslim and non-Muslim scholars, there is no question in terms of these things being done in the name of Allah according to the command and the teaching of Muhammad. Twelfthly, and this is where we pick up today, Jesus never took anyone's wife to be his own wife. As a matter of fact, he never took a wife, period. But you see, Muhammad did take among the many women uh, that we've already seen. There were over 20 women in uh, Muhammad's harem. He took another man's wife, and the man that he robbed of the wife was his adopted son. When Muhammad saw the beauty of his stepson, his adopted son's wife, he let it be known by a revelation from Allah that this woman, which was another man's wife, should be Muhammad's wife. Thus, his adopted son had to divorce his wife, and then she in turn was given to Muhammad. And thus, in the Quran, we have a divine command from Allah that it's perfect appropriate, appropriately for Muhammad to take another man's wife. This incident in the life of Muhammad, which is recognized by Muslim and non-Muslim historians, has caused no end of difficulty and has caused numerous apostasies as Muslims have seen that it cannot be viewed as right not only to take someone else's wife, which they did in warfare all the time, but to take your own adopted son's wife. Something innate in the heart of man knows that this is one of the sins of Muhammad over which he should have repented. Jesus could not be con uh, accused of being a child molester or taking a child bride, but Muhammad did. 
he took several little girls, eight and nine years old. Aisha is one example. And he took these little girls and became sexually involved with these little girls, which according to the Hadith, were still playing with their dolls. Now, of course, in Islamic law and in Muslim countries in Iran, for example, a little eight or nine-year-old girl can be given to a 65-year-old man to be his wife, to share his bed and board. But something in the heart of a Westerner says, this is not right. No little girl should be married off. This child has not even reached puberty. What is she doing being sexually molested by this older man? This has caused no end of difficulty because Westerners have a hard time embracing the idea that under Islamic law, a little girl of eight and nine years old can be given to an adult male in marriage. All foods clean. Now that he had come, he was removing all the Old Testament laws that prepared the way for his coming, for his death, and for his resurrection. Thus Jesus said, it is not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, it is what comes out of a man. And out of the heart of man comes adultery and murder and fornication and these things. And then Mark adds, by this saying, Jesus cleansed all foods. Thus Christians do not have to make a distinction between kosher and non-kosher food. Instead, they eat all that they can eat, regardless of what it is, all to the glory of God. But Muhammad, still trapped in the 7th century Arabian culture, viewed certain foods, such as swine flesh, pork, as being unclean. And whereas Christians can now uh, eat pork, they can now take the fruit of the grape. For the Muslims, Muhammad said you cannot have wine, you cannot have pork, you cannot have this, and you cannot have that. Jesus freed us from such laws. Muhammad gave those laws back to buying people. Fifteen, according to the New Testament, Jesus died for us on the cross since he had no sin of his own. His death was on the behalf of his people. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 1.21 we read, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He did that according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3 and following, Christ Jesus died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again, according to the Scriptures. But when you turn to Muhammad, did he die for us? No. Did he die for our sins? No. He died for his own sins. One of the reasons that most people simply do not understand uh, why the Muslims or the Muslims and the Christians simply cannot get along together is the fact that most Muslims are convinced that Muhammad was murdered by a Jew. This was a Jewess whose relatives had been killed, slaughtered, in one of the Jewish settlements that Muhammad and his followers had looted. Thus, to the Muslim mind, the Jews murdered Muhammad. Now, if you are a devout Muslim and these Jews murdered Allah's prophet and apostle, do you really think that any American diplomat is going to solve that problem? But you see, Muhammad died for his own sins. If indeed he was killed, though I have my doubts about it in terms of scholarship, if he was killed by a Jewess because of his sins and the slaughter of Jews as he sought to loot and to enslave them, then he died for his own sins. He did not die for you, and he did not die for me. But you see, when Jesus died, he rose again after the third day, according to the scriptures. But Muhammad did not rise from the dead. Now, of course, later Muslim uh, apologists, as they saw the obvious disadvantage they were in concerning the life of Muhammad would begin to make statements like, well, if Jesus rose from the dead, then so did Muhammad. But there's no teaching in the Quran that Muhammad would rise from the dead or even that Muhammad would ascend into heaven. There's no teaching of that. In the New Testament, we are told, for example, in the book of Acts, 
He ascended into heaven as they were watching. They were eyewitnesses of his ascension. This was even something predicted in the Old Testament, commented, described in the Gospels, preached in the Acts, and then explained in the epistles in such places as Ephesians 4. But Muhammad did not ascend into heaven. When he died, he died, and his body rotted in the tomb. He was not like the Lord Jesus Christ who broke the power of death, the grave, and hell itself. Eighthly, Jesus Christ is now in heaven as our intercessor and Savior, according to the New Testament. Having ascended on high, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. But when you read the Koran, Allah says there is no intercessor, there is no Savior, there can be no intercessor. And you see, the Koran was so careful to point out that there was no intercessor because of the three daughters of Allah, Alat, Aluza, and Manat, who were always viewed as the intercessors between man and Allah. Thus, Muhammad says, there is no Savior, there are no intercessors. Whereas the New Testament says, there is one mediator or intercessor between God and man, Christ Jesus the Lord. Thus, for example, in number 19, I one time was... Uh, in a conversation with a black Muslim friend in New York City. And he said, well, really, what's, what's the difference? I mean, Islam, Christianity, they both believe in one God. You know, really, in the end, it's the same religion. And I said, oh, Fred, and he still hadn't changed his name yet. Probably it ended up uh, Muhammad or something or the other. But at that point, it was still Fred. I said, Fred, there is a difference. As a Christian, I worship a living Savior. All you have as a Muslim is a dead prophet. He stopped dead in his tracks, and I'll never forget the look on his face. And he said, you know, you're right. I never thought about it. You have a living Savior who's in the world today, and I only have a dead prophet. You can't get a further contrast than that. Number 20, according to the New Testament, we can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. He's alive. He's now in heaven intercessing through the Holy Spirit. We pray to, we are involved with, we walk and talk with Jesus. But there's no personal relationship with Muhammad. He's dead and gone. No Muslim would talk about Muhammad is in their heart. We talk about Jesus being in the heart because he's God as well as man. As God, he's everywhere at the same time. As man, he's sitting on a throne, but he can be in our heart and be in heaven at the same time because he's God and man. But Muhammad is not divine. He cannot be in someone's heart. There is no personal relationship with Muhammad. He's a dead prophet. There can be no living relationship. Jesus, when he returns, will resurrect and judge all men. This is accepted and taught by Orthodox Islam. This is acknowledged because it is so clearly taught in the Bible. Even the Quran and the Hadith reveal that Muslims originally taught that Jesus was the one who would return, resurrect, and judge all men at the end of the world. But nowhere are we ever told that Muhammad is going to return. Nowhere are we ever told that Muhammad is going to resurrect or judge anyone. That is left to Jesus to be the judge of all the earth. And finally, lastly, Jesus is to be worshipped as God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity. For there is one God eternally existent in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And thus we can pray to Jesus, we can worship Jesus, we love Jesus, we trust Jesus, and Jesus gets us through this life of woe and of blessing. But you know, when it comes to Muhammad, because we have a dead prophet, a dead prophet with whom we can have no personal relationship, a dead prophet who will not return, resurrect, or judge anyone, this prophet Muhammad is not worshipped, he is not adored, he is not loved, he is only to be followed in terms of the religion that he left upon the face of the earth. This is why 
for over a thousand years, Muslims have been very hesitant to compare the life of Jesus Christ to that of Muhammad. When you think about it, Jesus being predicted in the Old Testament, fulfilling hundreds of prophecies from his birth right to his session or his sitting down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The material in the Gospels that speak of his miraculous birth and how that he spoke as no other man has ever spoken. He did what no other man has ever done. Those who followed him for, were from every race and rank of mankind. And not only, we did, not only do we discover in the pages of the New Testament concerning what Jesus said, what Jesus did, who followed him, but also who he was. Thus, according to the New Testament, in eight places specifically and elsewhere in terms of context, Jesus Christ is called God. Not that he was the Father, not that he was the Holy Spirit, but one God eternally existent in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thus John 1, 1 and 1, 2, beginning in that famous gospel account, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was alongside of God the Father, and the Word, according to its nature, was also God. Then in verse 14, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of God the Father in the face of Jesus Christ. Thus in verse 18, no one has ever seen God the Father, but God the Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him or exegeted him as we saw in our comparison between Allah and God. In the Christian religion, God penetrates history. He breaks through the space-time barrier and actually enters into history. He enters into humanity. He becomes man of very man as well as God the very God. The incarnation is one of the greatest truths of the Christian gospel. And it is also the heart of the Christian gospel without the fact that God was manifested in the flesh in Jesus Christ as the unique theanthropic person, the God-man, Christianity would simply be relegated to the relics and to the trash heap of other religion. But when you compare the incarnation of Jesus Christ and what he did in terms of his sinless life of his victorious death on the cross, you discover his superiority in all things. When you compare this with Muhammad, with his life as a child, when you compare his call to be a prophet, his adventures as a youth, and when you finally see, in terms of his life, the violence that he perpetrated in the name of Allah, the lives that were killed and ruined, the families that were destroyed, the husbands killed, the women forced into harems and raped at will, the children sold into slavery, mass looting of entire cities. Can there be any comparison whatsoever between the Lord Jesus Christ and Muhammad? I think any rational person comparing the Jesus of the New Testament to the Muhammad of the Quran and the Hadith can only say that Jesus is the greater, Muhammad the lesser. Jesus is superior, Muhammad is inferior. Jesus is Lord, Muhammad is not Lord. In this seminar, we have underscored the reality that when it comes to a comparison of Jesus and Muhammad, they could not have been sent by the same deity because they did not preach, teach, or do the same thing. The Bible, and you will see that the Bible teaches this, and thus the Quran 
is based upon the Bible and not the other way around. Now, Muhammad was right. This is a point of logic and of chronology. The Bible was completed 600 years before Muhammad began his ministry. Given this fact, the older must always judge the newer. The greater must judge the lesser. The authentic has to judge anyone that's a counterfeit or anything that claims to also belong to be, uh, to be part of God's word. Thus, whenever there is a disagreement between what the Bible says and what the Koran says, logically speaking, the Koran must give way just like the Book of Mormon has to give way. The divine principles have to give way. The so-called visions of Ellen G. White have to give way. And all the teachings of the astrologers, the soothsayers, the New Ages, and Ramtha and Lazarus, and all the other uh, gurus and psychics, what they say must be judged in the light of what is already established as an authority. Since the Koran appeals to the Bible, the lesser always appeals to the greater. Since the Koran bases its teaching on the authority of Scripture, whenever there is a disagreement between the two, the Koran must go, but the Bible will stay. Now, when you pick up a Koran and begin to read it, anyone who is familiar with the Bible in any sense will immediately feel that this is a different kind of literature. Matter of fact, the, the differences between what you find in the Bible and what you find in the Koran, just as literature, is phenomenal. Uh, they're not the same kind of literature. They, they don't feel the same. They don't sound the same. It's not structured the same. In no way can they be compared. The only literary parallels that you will find to the Koran are those of pagan writings in pre-Islamic Arabia that were the result of these volcanic, ecstatic, bursting out speeches of ancient soothsayers. As a matter of fact, when you pick up the Bible and you read it, the New Testament just reads like the Old Testament. And there's a natural flow. But when you go from the Bible to the Koran, you immediately step from that which is familiar to that which is not familiar. The Koran, since these are ecstatic speeches, the result of those trance-like states into which Muhammad would fall, there is, we'll see, no logical order, there's no historical narrative, it's jumbled, because of its seeming incoherent style and irrational nature, Western scholars, just speaking on a literary level, have had some very hard things to say about the Koran and I think you ought to listen to these men whose opinions on such matters should be accepted and should be respected. For example, the English scholar Thomas Carlyle, speaking concerning the Koran, said this, It is a toilsome reading, as I ever undertook, a wearisome, confused, jumbled, crude, incondite, nothing but a sense of duty could carry any European through the Koran. Or again, the great German scholar Solomon Reinach stated, quote, From the literary point of view, the Koran has little merit. Declamation, repetition, purality, a lack of logic and coherence strike the unprepared reader at every turn. It is humiliating to the human intellect to think that this mediocre literature has been the subject of innumerable commentaries and that millions of men are still wasting time in absorbing it, end quote. The historian Edward Gibbon, who wrote the book The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, actually several volumes, uh, he could not be considered a Christian by any stretch of the imagination any more than anyone considered a Solomon Reinach. But Edward Gibbon has this to say about the Koran as literature, quote, The Koran is an incoherent rhapsody of fable and precept and declamation, which sometimes crawls in the dust and sometimes is lost in the clouds, end quote. McClintock and Strong's well-known encyclopedia states this, the matter of the Koran is exceedingly incoherent and sententious, 
The book evidently being without any logical order of thought, either as a whole or in its parts, this agrees with the dulcerary and incidental matter in which it is said to have been delivered. In quote. Even the Muslim scholar Ali Dashti laments the literary defects of the Quran. Quote, Unfortunately, the Quran was badly edited and its contents are very abstrusely arranged. All students of the Quran wonder why the editors did not use the natural and logical method of ordering by date of revelation, as in the copy of Ali Ab Abi Tali's lost copy of the text. And when you turn to the standard reference works which deal with Islam, for example, the concise encyclopedia of Islam, it refers to, quote, the disjointed and irregular character of the text of the Quran. You see, right at the beginning, there are many distinctions that must be made between the Bible and the Quran. They evidently could not have come from the same God because they are so absolutely distinct in so many ways. For example, in this chart, we have listed just a, a few of the ways in which the Quran and the Bible are different. For example, the Bible is a library of books. It isn't even one book. It's 66 books written by over 40 different authors and it took over 2,000 years to put it together. Thus, it is a library of books and when one author, let's say uh, someone in the New Testament, let's say the Apostle Paul will quote the book of Isaiah to prove something, this is not circular reasoning because circular reasoning is only valid if you're dealing with one book. But the Bible is 66 books and not one book. But the Quran is one book. Whereas the Bible had over 40 different authors, in terms of Western scholarship, we would consider that Muhammad, even though he did not write it, yet he did speak it, he did recite it, was the human author. Of course, as we'll see, the Muslims would deny this. They say that Allah is the author. There are no human authors. And despite the fact that in the Old and the New Testament, the Bible would refer to itself as being written by Isaiah, David, Paul, or Peter, the Muslims say that the Quran was not written by anyone. It literally dropped out of heaven. It was brought down or handed down. Matter of fact, the Arabic word for revelation means handed down, and it cannot be paired to the, compared to the Christian concept uh, in which the authors of Scripture were inspired as its human authors to write according to his will. Whereas the Bible took over 2,000 years in the writing, the Quran, in terms of its material, took place over a 30-year period. The Bible admits human authorship uh, as well as divine. It is God's word and man's word at the same time. Just like Jesus is God as well as man, the Bible is human and divine at the same time. John wrote John, but he wrote only what God wanted him to write. So yes, it is John's gospel but at the same time, it is God's gospel. But the Muslims deny any human authorship. The only author is Allah. And thus, uh, in the scriptures, we find that the authors, since it is admitted human authorship, used pre-existing material in the making of their books. Thus, Luke tells us he did research and gathered materials and did interviews. And that is why he could tell us all these little biographical uh, little incidents and anecdotes that no one else gives us because he used pre-existing material and sources. Christians do not deny that the biblical authors used the books that were written before him. So Paul, let's say, would quote from Isaiah. He would also quote from the Greek philosophers. So in Christian theology, the authors of the Bible, the human authors, used pre-existing material. But you see, with, in Islam, they deny that the Quran used any pre-existing material or sources because Allah was the author in heaven. There was no human author on earth. And when you read the Bible and you open it up, Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim hashemaim hasharet, says that when the beginning began, God created the heavens and the earth hashemaim out of nothing. 
And as you read through the Bible, you find everything in chronology till you finally come to the last book of the Bible, which talks about the end of the world. Thus, when you have the Bible, you have a sense in which you are dealing with all of human history from the beginning to the end. So the Bible begins with the creation, then deals with the fall, and then you have the tower, then you'll have the flood, and then you'll have this, and then you'll have that. And you'll have all of these things uh, that are situated in terms of a chronology so that you naturally proceed from the creation to the fall of man, to the redemption of man, to the flood that came as punishment for sin, to the building of the Tower of Babel, to the division of the nations, to the beginning of the patriarchs and of the nation of Israel through Abraham. And you study all of this, the rise and fall of the nation of Israel, and then finally its captivity under the Assyrians and under Babylonians, its return under Cyrus, the preparation for the rebuilding of the nation and of the temple, the coming of the Messiah. Then the Messiah comes. And, and finally you come in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, to the description of the end of the universe. Thus you have all of human history from beginning to end revealed in the Bible in a chronological order and it gives you this sense of history. But when you turn to the Quran, there is no concept of beginning. There's no concept of end. It's rambling. It's jumbled. It's coherent. There is no structure in the sense of beginning at the beginning and going right through to the end. This is why the Bible is structured according to chronology or theme, whereas when the Muslims had to deal with the problem of the Quran after Muhammad died, the only way that they could figure out, and this was the caliph, his son-in-law, Uthman, who had married Aisha, the only way that he ended up structuring it was according to the size of the surah. You say, to the size of the book? That's right. So uh, when they came to collect and put together the Quran, because there was no original manuscript, as no one knew when Muhammad would fall on the ground and he would begin to jerk and his eyes would roll back and he would begin to have difficulties in speaking and they'd put that blanket on him because it was an embarrassment to see this man rolling on the ground. No one knew when he would have a seizure. What we in Western scholarship would say something like epilepsy or something of that nature. No one knew when the prophet was going to give one of these ecstatic type of releases like a volcano that explodes. And thus, he himself uh, was basically illiterate. He could do a little bit of reading and writing. He could write his name on a treaty, things of that nature. But he didn't write out the Koran. It was not a reasoned treatise. These were simply ecstatic, uh, spontaneous outbursts that followed either a vision, a dream, a seizure, something of that nature. And at first, uh, there was no concept of writing it down. And Many of those early surahs were simply forgotten or confused and on some occasions the person who was the only one who remembered it got killed in battle. So they decided we better start writing this down but because no one knew when he would have a seizure they would write it down on whatever was available. The bones of animals. Uh, they were eating a lamb and he began to speak and they'd grab a shoulder blade or a leg bone and begin try to carve a in Arabic, what he was saying, or they'd pick up a stone and try to write on it, or uh, take the palm mat that they were sitting on, and they would try tree bark, and uh, they tried all sorts of things. Uh, Ali Dashti uh, points out that the Hadith and other revealed that in some cases the animals would eat the palm leaves on which the, uh, the surah had been recorded. But when he died, it was unexpected, and nothing was arranged and collected, and it was all scattered, and the tree bark was crumbling and animals were eating the palm leaves and the bones were just not working out too good. And when they had to try to put the Koran together, they finally decided just to arrange it from the biggest to the little. So as you open up the Koran, you begin with the largest surah, like a chapter, but it's an individual revelation, and it goes all the way down to the smallest one. Regardless, in terms of chronology, 
when Muhammad gave that particular revelation. Because religious speakers tend to get more long-winded the longer they are in the ministry, so the older the preacher, the longer his sermons, uh, most Western scholars on that basic premise as well as the internal evidence of what is referred to in each individual surah uh, for many years in terms of trying to date these surahs have discovered that most of the early surahs were the small ones and as Muhammad went on his speeches got longer and longer because he had more to talk about. Thus when you open the Quran you're not reading what Muhammad gave at the beginning, but what he gave at the end. And when you get to the end of the book, you're at the beginning of his ministry. See, to the Western mind, this is, this is, you're not beginning at the beginning, you're beginning at the end, and when you're at the end, you're at the beginning. It's exceedingly difficult. That's why Western scholars have pointed out that there's such a confusion with the Quran, no logical rela relationship between one surah to the other. They were arranged according to to size, irrespective of subject matter, irrespective of the chronology, when they were revealed. But this is not what we find in the Bible. The Bible is ordered and structured. You have a themes, you have clumpings. In the New Testament, the Gospels are the manifestation of Christ. The book of Acts is the proclamation of Christ. The church epistles are the explanation of Christ. The general epistles are the application of that, and the book of Revelation is the theme of expectation of the return of Christ. The Bible is not arranged according to something as incoherent as size. Instead, it's arranged according to theme and chronology, whereas the Quran is structured simply according to size. Thus, it is no surprise to find that whereas the Bible has historical narrative, you won't find historical narratives in the Quran. It simply is not there. You're not told about the life of Muhammad in terms of his birth and his life, and like we are told concerning Abraham or Moses or Jesus or any of that type. We're not given historical narrative. These are only ecstatic, these spontaneous utterances. Uh, the only literary parallel would be the types of things you would find in the Greek mystery religions or the soothsayers and the magicians of the pagan religions. When you turn to the Bible, you find poetry, like in the book of uh, Psalms. You find prose, historical narratives, such, let's say, in First and Second Kings. You find doctrinal treatments, such as the book of Romans, uh, historical and prophetic, uh, in different kinds of literature, all throughout the Bible. But the Quran has only one kind, kind of literature, one kind of genre, and that is ecstatic utterances, speeches that were spontaneous, and no one knew when they would come, no one knew when they would begin, and no one knew when they would end. And as I said, they were recorded on whatever happened to be lying around, and if there was no one there to write and nothing to write on, they just tried hard to remember, but you know how that goes. Tenthly, uh, the scriptures are exalted in subject matter, dealing with the transcendence of God and the glory of God and man's salvation. But when you read the Quran, it's often mundane, and domestic. There are surahs in which Allah is spending his time instructing Muhammad's wives not to argue in his presence, not to bicker, not to demand more money. They must receive new wives. Or, or for example, he was having a problem with the other sheiks coming to his home and wanting to sit down and eat with them. And, and finally, Allah reveals in a surah, which is very convenient for Muhammad, all sorts of rules about now you can come visit Muhammad. This is not a right time. This is what you can do in his presence. This is what you can't do in his presence. It's almost as if you have a book of etiquette in terms of how to act when you visit Muhammad's home. Do you find anything like that in Scripture? Did you find any etiquette rules to how to deal with Jesus? You don't find that type of material in the Bible. Eleven, you find that the Scripture has reasoned discourse uh, that uses logic. For example, the book of Romans, or you can look at Corinthians. For example, Paul would say, if anyone, in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. If you're not a new creature, you're not in Christ. That's called the denial of the consequence 
in logic and it's valid. But when you turn to the Quran, you do not find any rational discourses because once again, the Quran was written by Allah in heaven on a stone table. It was not written by Muhammad. He couldn't write as far as we know. Instead, they were ecstatic utterances and there was no writing material at all. Lastly, in terms, not lastly, but number 12, the Bible does not contain any errors. It does not contain any contradictions. People have tried down through the years to try to find some mistake, some error, but in the end, they have all been resolved by the science of archaeology or some other linguistic discipline. But when you come to the Quran, as we shall see, it bristles with errors. It is filled with contradictions. And as we shall see, these contradictions are of such a significant nature. For example, the claim that uh, Muhammad was called to be a prophet is given four conflicting stories. Which one is right? They can't all be right. Lastly, the Bible reveals who God is and what he is like, while the Quran emphasizes that God cannot be known by man. The Bible as literature is superior and greater to the Quran and as the older already established revelation it must be accepted whenever and wherever it contradicts the Holy Scriptures. In this comparison the Quran comes out the loser.